What's up, podcast listeners? My name is Jones. I'm here with Sam, your Franklin of Sam Franklin Basketball. Man, what's going on? I'm good, man. How you been? I have zero complaints. We got the, the quarantine scruff going on right now for the, the video man. viewers. <laughs> <laughs> so, question, Sam, uh, catch us up to – I mean, you recently graduated college, recent to me. Catch us up to where you are now and your basketball history. So right now I am full-time basketball training. So that's been for the last, since last June about I started going full-time. So I had a day job before then and sort of quit the day job and now I'm full-time. So that's been really fun the last, so almost close to a year now. Uh, so in terms of my basketball journey, played in high school, super injury prone. Uh, I missed most of my sophomore year and then all of my junior year with various injuries. So that kind of put a damper on my basketball career. I ended up playing up at a local junior college. Missed my freshman year there too <laughs> with more injuries. So it was kind of just, I missed like three out of five years. It was kind of brutal. I played my sophomore year. It went all right. Could have went better, could have went worse. And then uh, I transferred to a division three school and, between my sophomore and my junior year, I stopped playing and I started my business. And so the stuff that I was doing in route between graduating high school kind of set it up to get me to the point where, you know, a year out of college, I was able to go full time with this. Now you, how did you come about the basketball training industry? Now you were a player and you attended some basketball training sessions and some camps and clinics, correct? Yeah, so um, I had a trainer for a little bit when I was, like, really little. But I think early in high school, I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach because I didn't know you could do basketball training as, like, a real job. And then through a series of circumstances, I ended up meeting Damon Altizer. I know he's been on your podcast a few times. He's a friend and a mentor of mine. We met at his camp. And so meeting him online and ended up talking with him and whatnot and meeting him, I realized, like, man, he was like the first person I really saw that did like basketball training as a full-time job. And once I saw that, I knew like, this is exactly what I want to do whenever I'm done, whatever point I'm done playing, that's what I want to do. Like he was kind of the guy that inspired me to really want to get into this full-time and do it as a career. And I want to ask you more about that relationship a little bit later into the, the, the case study but first what did you uh, you're a sophomore in college right now you're kind of playing you're not playing you're injury prone how did you start training was it middle schoolers high schoolers was it Dakota talk me through that nexus that that part yeah so um I actually start kind of started right out of high school so like I ended up coaching an AAU team with one of my friends right out of high school. It was through the YMCA. And I ended up coaching, training a few of the kids. I was charging like 20 bucks an hour at the time. I was 18. It was just nice to get a couple of dollars in my pocket. And then uh, after that AAU season was done, I ended up getting hired on staff at that YMCA. And so during the summers for like 10 weeks, they would do this like huge D-League program. So it was like 10 weeks, three days a week. There's three to four groups and there's like 25 to 35 kids in each group. And we're just doing group work, massive group workouts with those kids, different age groups. So like second through fourth, fifth through six, seven through eight. And then there was a girls group too at the beginning. And so I got a, uh, a crazy amount of experience over three summers doing that. And so I was, I would end up training, like working with over a hundred kids a week. Now I wasn't getting paid very much. I was getting paid like nine bucks an hour to do that. <laughs> So, but the experience I got was kind of invaluable because like I'm working with over a hundred kids a week of like varying ages and skill levels. And so you learn how to deal with kids that are just starting out, kids that have nominal experience, kids that relative to like what you would expect at a YMCA are relatively talented. You can do a little bit more with. And so I got a ridiculous amount of experience doing that. But after like my third summer, as the third summer started, I'm like, I'm still only making like 220 a paycheck, like <laughs> training three days a week. Like this is kind of ridiculous. And so I was like, if I had these kind of numbers myself, I'd be making an insane amount of money. Like I'm, 
And that kind of convinced me to go out on my own. And so I uh, started the business that summer of 2016 while I was still working at the YMCA. Now, how did that, how did that go? Was there any conflict of interest there after you saw the count numbers, saw what you were making and saw you had a better chance at doing better on your own? There was definitely some conflict of interest there, man. I, uh, I'm actually technically banned from like 25 different YMCA's in my area right now because, uh, yeah. So I, during that summer, I would, while I was still doing the training, so we would go Monday, Wednesday, Saturdays for the D league group. And so on Saturdays, my boss would leave after the third session of D league. And so the fourth session would be up at like 1230. I'd have lunch ready for me at 1235 brought to the place I'd eat. And then I would go do workouts with kids that had YMCA memberships, sneak them in and I'd do workouts for like three hours on Saturdays. And then I'd do them some nights when I knew my boss wouldn't be there. So I, effectively I was getting free gym space because the place had like five courts, the YMCA that I was at. And so uh, I got caught up and they banned me. <laughs> That's, that's tough, though. So, like, mm, talk me through that, man. Did you feel morally convicted while you were doing it? Or was it just like, man, bro, I'm, I'm helping these kids out. I'm making so much money. Like, I've already spent four hours in a gym this morning, and I know they're not paying me very much at all. Like, what was your thought process while you were doing it? You got to get it how you get it sometimes, man. Like, I was court – you already know how court space is at a premium, man. It's, it's tough to – it can be expensive. It can be tough to find somewhere you can get in consistently. I'm like, these kids have memberships. It's not like I'm sneaking them in and they're not paying. Like they have memberships. I have a membership. Like the only, re the only like moral thing was like, all right, I just got to make sure I don't get caught. <laughs> like, and it wasn't even really my fault that I got caught. One of my friends, he was a good friend of mine at the time. Uh, he was, he worked, he did the D league with me. He was also training kids on the side too. And, uh, I had gotten some shirts made at the time because I was going to do a free clinic to get more kids in the gym. And he was going to help me with the free clinic. So some of those kids would go to him too. And I gave him a shirt and this is after I quit working there. And he left the shirt behind the front desk, forgot to take it home. And my original shirts had my website on the back. And so my former boss comes in the next day, sees the shirt, Sam Franklin basketball.com. What's this? Typed in the website, and there's literally videos of me training kids at the YMCA on the website. And so it, it that got turned over real quick. <laughs> Yo, what was that conversation like with you and your former boss when he found out? I didn't even have a conversation with him. He just canceled my membership. And <laughs> it literally just says, Term your membership. I got a, I tried to go in a day because I was still playing at the time to work out. And my former coworkers, they were like, this is weird. It says your membership has been terminated indefinitely for a violation of YMCA rules. <laughs> and I got a cease and desist letter from the legal department of the YMCA telling me to take the videos down. What? Okay. So I can imagine, like, all funny stuff aside, like, it's pretty serious. Now you have to find another gym to train all these athletes yeah. that you built up. How did you move after that? So I, I was already in the process of finding other places before I had uh, quit. So I was, I knew that that wasn't going to be a long-term solution for gym space, like sneaking around and, but it worked in the short term. It was great. I made, I was able to make pretty much all profit and not have to pay for gym space because my membership was free because I worked there. Um, there was this church that was relatively close to the YMCA I was working at. And I had heard that uh, they had a gym I think I had an AAU practice there when I was younger, actually. And so I went, I just walked into the facility and I found the guy who managed the gym part of it, the facilities manager. And he ended up giving me a sweet deal. He's like, well, we want to bless you. So you can play. So while you're building up your business, you can pay whatever you feel you can. And we'll put it into a scholarship fund for some of our people that want to, some of our kids at the church that want to do certain things and can't do them. Amen. And so, so there, he was like, whenever you can, whenever uh, it's available, just call ahead. 
and then uh, I'll let, if it's available on this day, you can use it. And so there was a couple of days a week I would use that place. And then I found some other churches. And then eventually the place I mainly use now, a trainer that also trained out of that YMCA that would sneak in. There was a lot of, there was a lot of that going on at the YMCA. But uh, this trainer I knew I, I was cool with, he told me about this rec center that had eight courts and they do $5 open gyms and you can train there and they won't say anything. And so I started doing that and they had great hours. They're open like nine to nine every day. Go there and open gym, your player pays five bucks and you can train them as long as you want. They can stay there the whole day. And eventually I started renting space out there at the times where uh, the peak hours where there was not as much availability because it's an open gym. So I can't just kick kids off the court because they're five dollars worth the same as mine. So I started renting out and now I, I'd use it like 80% of the time. Was it, is it super competitive to lock down gym time during those premium hours at that space? Do you book well in advance or mm -hmm. how do you navigate that? Not so much anymore. When I started there, it used to be. Um, like it used to be insane to try to lock down space when I first started using it. They raised their rates a little bit. Um, so it's not as difficult now, but like they still do open gyms. And so like, even though it's not tough to rent down space, you never know what day is gonna be packed with open gym. And if it's packed with open gym, if I haven't rented out the space, it's gonna be impossible for me to train there. So I just started renting out regardless. I'm sure this, this spot is more ideal possibly during the winter times. Do these churches that you used to rent from, do they have church leagues, different tournaments that they have the gym occupied with when you were using so, these gyms or the church gyms or no? So actually the place, this, uh, this eight core facility, it was initially a soccer facility, indoor soccer facility. So it only had initially had two basketball courts there. And so they actually, the courts are portable. So they take the, the courts are on there from April until no, early November. And then from early November until April, they take the courts and the hoops off and then it's indoor soccer. So they only have two courts, which they use for volleyball during the winter. So I actually used the churches for my in-season training on Sunday nights. Ah, yeah, that's wise. I see how you navigated that. Okay, so you worked in the YMCA, you don't work there anymore. You find a church, then you find this facility that was formerly an uh, indoor soccer, uh, indoor soccer facility. You last June, where were you working at your full time job? Was that the YMCA that you quit from? Is this all recently within a year, or was there another job that you had before you quit to go full time? No, so I, yeah, this was a different job. So I actually quit the YMCA in 2016. So I've been working there for four years now. <laughs> Um, so after I graduated college, I got my degree in exercise science um, to help with the training part. I uh, got a job at a high school as a security guard, basically. So as a student supervisor. And so it was kind of the perfect job right out the gate because I'm working from 7.30 to 3.30. I, get, I got benefits. Um, I got like 14, 15 an hour, something like that. And then I ended up getting a coaching job at the school. But on top of that, because the job was 7.30 to 3.30, it didn't interfere with my training at all. So I could work and then I'm done at 3.30. It's 15 minutes away from the gym that I use and I can drive straight to the gym, get on the highway, get straight to the gym and I can do my workouts or I can go home if my workouts don't start for a couple of hours. Man, so let's, let's, let's pause there for a second and I would like to hear you rant on the benefits and the the hard things that come with having a part-time job and training. So you've mentioned some of it, you have benefits, but what was the administrative struggle or any of the struggles with training while you had a part-time job, if any? There weren't that many. It was mostly just, I was just tired a lot, man. <laughs> like I got to wake up at six something to get to work. And then I'm on my feet walking around the school dealing with, you know, I deal with the, I would deal with the kids that were, most of the kids are great. You know, they have awesome personalities. They're in class to do what they're supposed to do, but I'm security. So I deal with a lot of kids that aren't doing what they're supposed to do. So I'm on my feet. I'm walking around the school the whole day. You know, I'm getting 10, 15,000 steps at the school. I'm dealing with kids that don't want to be in class. I want to curse you out. that don't care what you have to say. That want to get in fights. 
And so most of the kids are great, but, you know, dealing with that can, can grate on you. And so it was mostly I was – the biggest thing was I was just tired because I would be, at, I'd be on, at work for eight hours and then I've got another three or sometimes five hours of workouts depending on the day after that. And so being tired was I – was, I was able to use my phone while I'm at work sporadically, so I was still able to text clients and schedule things I need to get scheduled, so that wasn't a huge issue. But just not having as much time to do other stuff and being tired. Because I get home from workouts at 9, something like 9.30, 10 o'clock. I got to eat afterwards and then I got to shower and I want to relax a little bit. And then, you know, 12, 12 30, I got to wake up at 6 30. And so that was probably the hardest part. And you did that for how long? I did it for one school year. So uh, I still coach at the school. So that's why I do most, most of my time is spent during the winter. But the job, they ended up hiring more professional security guards, like former police officers. And so they offered me a different position but I did not want to take the position that they offered me. So I just, and I was already thinking of going full-time anyway. So it was kind of like a perfect out. I understand that. So you, uh, let me think. And that was that the main reason they were want to transition you to a different job. You said, okay, nope, I'm going to do it. What did your finances, and you don't have to go deeply into the numbers. It seems like you don't mind sharing numbers, but what did your process look like? from not having this part-time job to going full-time and having to make up for those lost hours that you were not working in the gym? So that was, I got the part-time job because my, the training part wasn't where I wanted it to be, where I wasn't, and granted, I still stay at home right now. So I was, I was planning on moving out like next month before all this coronavirus stuff started. So being able to stay at home has been a huge help with that and being able to build up the business. But uh, I, it wasn't, when I graduated college, I was doing fine, but it wasn't at a point where I was anywhere close to comfortable going full time. And then that year between college, graduating college and uh, by the end of that school year, I was making way more money last year than I was the year before, like double the amount of money I was making from the year before. And so at that point, I'm like, well, if this, it had been consistent for, of that double increase for what, March, April, three months, because the school year ended in June. So for three straight months, I had had that consistent double the growth of the last year. So at that point, I'm like, well, I can keep this going and keep expanding, then I can make up the difference if I keep growing. And so that was kind of my mindset. How were you doubling? What were you doing to double? I'm assuming you mean you were grossing more, you were profiting more. I'm not sure what you mean by that, but how were you doubling? Gross was double. Like in terms of what I would make in a month, what I made on the year was double from the year before, pretty much, from training. Um, I don't think I really did anything specific. I feel like, I mean, I feel like I've gotten better every year, but... I don't think I got double better the year in terms of the actual uh, instruction from the year before, but um, more kids started showing up. I had a consultation with uh, Jordan Lolly from his trainers got to success thing a couple years ago. I had raised my rates. So part of that was part of what helped. I had more kids that were new coming in with the rates and I started doing package deals, which helped. So this, like subscription monthly based package deals where try to get kids in the gym more consistently um, by getting them in more consistently at a lower rate, they're still paying more overall and they're coming more often. So I think the package deals and the raised rates helped and getting new kids in at those raised rates and just consistency. I don't think there's any one specific thing that got it to where I doubled my money. What else did uh, J-Law, if you can share, what else did he suggest on his consultation? I had mine, too, at the end of the program. It was pretty helpful. Pretty dope, actually. Yeah, I, um, we talked about just goal setting in terms of what I was trying to do, uh, short-term, long-term. 
we talked about uh an online like online programs which i actually never i, I probably should have but i never actually got into that and uh we talked about facility rentals versus owning a facility and stuff like that because initially that was a goal of mine and you know we talked about this where it's like I don't think most trainers actually want to own a facility. They just want somewhere cheap that they can train whenever they want. <laughs> and so uh, right. those were, those were the biggest things that we talked about outside of some financial stuff that to, to make it better. He was like, what I was charging at the time was selling myself short in terms of what I could be doing. I, like I, I agreed because there's a, there's this massive, uh, training company in my area they at one point they were training over 500 kids um and they do they charge over 300 a month and you have to pay that 325 350 a month like there's no drop-in rate there's no pay as you go it's you pay 325 350 a month and you come two to three days a week and in groups of 20 to 30 Okay, let's let's sit on that. Why do you think people are willing to pay that much for that large of a group? How many sessions are they getting for that three twenty five, three fifty per month? Depends on the time of year, but like two to three sessions a week. Um, and I I I, I am blessed to train in a relatively affluent area, which helps. So it's probably not as as affluent as Irvine, California is, <laughs> but uh it's a relatively affluent area and so that company's been around for like 10 years and so they've built up their reputation over time and they started charging more and more for their academy style training and people were because it's a relatively affluent area people just went along with it and so now i come in you know while they're eight plus years in already and people are so accustomed to paying that higher number for them that it's when I had that consult with Lolly, it just made sense because people are already used to paying X amount for training in the area. Like that's what a lot of it goes for. So do you, are they just focusing on basketball training? Are they offering other sport specific training as well? Uh, so they actually just opened up like a massive like four court facility that they own, that they uh, had got owns now. So uh, they do strength, they have a strength and conditioning part of the facility now too. So they do do that now, but before it was just basketball training and they run AAU teams now. So they run the whole, the, the trifecta out of their facility. It's actually like a basketball trainer dream. <laughs> and that's your competition per se, or do you even look at it as competition? What is your mindset with it? I mean, it, in a certain sense, it is competition. Like I have, I would say a large percentage of my players, and I couldn't give you like an actual percentage, but a large percentage of them have done, have been with that training company at some point in time. Like whether they were little, whether they were in middle school, elementary school, they were with them at some, a lot of them were with them at some point for some period of time, even if they just did like a camp. <laughs> so in a certain sense, yes. But like, for me, it's like, for if I do what I'm supposed to do, most kids aren't going to leave and I'll keep getting new kids. So I'm not super worried about it. Like, and now their facility is further away than what it used to be, the places they worked out of. So they, they train kids in cities that I don't really train kids in. So it's not, a, it's not as much anymore either. Right. Yeah, I'm sure there's an abundance. So what they eat doesn't make you boo-boo <laughs> at all. There's enough kids to go around, generally speaking. So for you, you mentioned AAU. What was that experience like for you? I remember talking to you about that when you had oh, God. two teams. <laughs> yeah, let's go down that road. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that was uh, – I was in college while I was doing that. That was the most stressful semester of my life, two semesters. So at the time, it was it, part of it was just bad timing. Um, I was still doing training at the time. So trying to build that up, getting my degree, doing the AAU and an intern, doing an internship for my degree at the same time. So that was a very long semester. Um, it's just a lot more involved, a lot involved. It's like a full-time job. 
you know, like you got to deal with all the financials, stuff's expensive. And I didn't really get in it to make money. I kind of wanted to help ki- some of the kids I trained that weren't happy with their AAU programs. And I kind of bit off more than I could chew with it in terms of starting more, more, te- more teams than I uh, should have had, not having the right kids in the program for some of them. Um, yeah, it's just a lot. That's a misconception. It was for me, too, thinking so many people want to start AAU teams, and some do it for the money, some do it for just, like you said, to help the kids out. But uh, my financial expert put it in a really good way. It's not always about the money, but you do want to be able to step in the gym the next day or the next month Mm -hmm. or go to the next tournament. And If you don't have a firm grasp of how much things cost and the finances, then you're not going to be doing it very long. But what were some of those troubles you, you came across more specifically? Well, I was broke at the time, and so I didn't do a great job collecting money, and some kids were poorer than others, and among a number of other things. And so because I was in college, and my training wasn't where it's at now, I didn't have really have that much money saved up, and so I couldn't really finance anything that wasn't from the money that was being brought in. So when the money wasn't right, it was stressful, <laughs> to say the least, because I didn't have the resources to front certain things that I would have needed to. And so that was probably the most stressful part. And then kids would quit, you know, the loyalty aspect is kind of tough. You know, like the gym I'm doing, like literally a, a, the team that's practicing in the next court at where the rec center we're using, one of the kids went to that team. So it's, those were probably the biggest issues. Uh, paying for tournaments in advance and getting into them and then, having kids not show up or whatever the case is, dealing with parents and playing time and a lot of things that people don't really think about that you got to got to do trying to get kids to college for the older kids, get kids recruited. And it's just constantly you're getting tugged in various different directions. And if you're not prepared, it's going to, it's going to be a very, very long season. If you were to do it again, first off, would you do it again? And what would you change if you were to do it again? If I were going to start an AAU program again, it would, I would have to have like an NBA player back in the program or something where it's sponsored. I don't have to worry about money. And um, that's the biggest thing. Like I don't have to worry about the financial aspects of it. Probably the uh, only other thing would be for me to coach, not have my own program, would be uh, if like a shoe team maybe offered. And even then, like I've gotten other offers to coach AAU and and get paid to coach it. And now that I'm training full time, I don't know that I want to pick because every day and weekend that I'm coaching AAU is a day that a weekend that I'm not training. It makes so, sense and that opportunity cost may not be worth it for you for exactly. those weekends. So how does that work with you coaching at high school? What are the benefits and the, the perks with that? And what are some of the things that you wish could change? Uh, so I generally like the guys that I coach with. We have a pretty good chemistry and rapport and I'm friends with, with those guys. So that's, it's been fun with that. Um, it gives me something to actually do during the winter. You know, kids have middle school kids have middle school basketball and then they have travel basketball. So they have practice twice a week for travel ball tournaments on the weekends and then middle school stuff for their teams during the week. Hold on. You guys actually allow kids to play middle school basketball and train for their travel basketball team on the same week. Yeah. I did it when I was in middle school. Everybody, wow. um, most of the kids, most of the kids uh, that actually play travel ball, they do both at the same time. And so those kids, so they don't have a ton of time for training for middle school because they're doing travel and middle school ball at the same time. And then high school kids have practices during the week and so in games and whatnot. And so it's not like there's like to do group workouts. It's not a good day during the week for me to train kids because I have my own games and practices. They have their own games and practices. So the week is kind of shot for training, for me anyways, especially in terms of being able to actually make money off of it. And so it gives me something to do during the week. Uh, I'm at a school that actually gives a pretty nice stipend. I believe we've talked about this before. 
And then, uh, so then that leaves Sundays open, where Sundays, for the middle school kids, on the weekends they don't have a tournament. They'll come in and train. And then for the high school kids, 95% of the time, 98% of the time, they don't have practice on a Sunday, barring some crazy circumstance. So they'll come in and get some extra work. And so it works out all that way. That makes sense. And I know a lot of, a lot of trainers listening to this right now either have part-time jobs or they are high school or middle school coaches. And you know, they don't have the luxury of probably the same stipend that you do, but they like the fact that they can stay busy. Um, what are some, I guess, tips you would give a trainer out there who is also a coach in making sure that they have classes filled on Sundays or to make that arrangement more efficient for them during the slower times of the winter? Yeah, so um, for me, Sundays work, like I said, Sundays work best. I think the, and the weeks, it varies. It still, for me, varies from week to week. Like, I can have two privates and like three, four workouts, like filled with eight people in each workout. And I can have a day where I only train like 10 kids on a Sunday. So it really depends on, but reaching out earlier in the week to check with uh, parents uh, for middle school kids on if they have a tournament that weekend or not. And on the weekends, they don't have tournaments, try to make sure they're in the gym that Sunday. Uh, For the high school kids, Some kids are a lot more receptive to uh, training in season than others. Usually those are the ones that end up playing in college. (laughs) Um, But, or just really, really love the game. Obviously some, some weeks they're just dead from the week and they, they shouldn't be training that Sunday, but if they have good, if the kids have good energy, you should be consistently hitting up those kids. Like, Hey, do you want to get in the gym this Sunday? And once the kids usually are in start the Sunday workouts, they usually want to keep doing the Sunday workouts the kids that do do it. Okay, so random, random questions now that, that are coming to mind. What biggest piece of advice to a college student who is about to graduate, e-graduate, uh, I'd assume, I don't know. Uh, golly, I feel bad. <laughs> golly, I feel bad. Damn. But what would, you, what would you advise them who want to become basketball trainers full-time, part-time, or just get in the game? Um, learn as much as you can. Right. Like I, I have learned so much since I graduated college just from in life, obviously, but like basketball wise, like constant learning, uh, get into coaching too. You know, like it's funny how co- a lot of coaches actually feel about skills trainers and skills training. Um, and so get into coaching, it changes your perspective and you learn a lot more that way and you get to see things from the other side of the fence. And I think that's important. So coaching is super important at any level. It helps. But if you can coach like school basketball, I think it works a little bit better. And then so learning, coaching, and just get experience. Like ultimately, ultimately you got to, you know, all these jobs that people apply for after they get degrees, they want what, like a master's degree and seven years of experience for an entry level job or whatever. But this job has no barriers to entry. So find it. So once you you've learned, you're, you've done some learning and stuff, just find a kid and give it your all and get that kid better at the end of the day. Like if you get it, but I think I'm going to butcher Dana's quote, but if you focus on the, uh, if you're in the business of. I'm, the I'm business sorry. of building the player, the business will take care. If you're exactly, in the business yeah. of building the player, then your business will take care of itself. It's something along those lines, not verbatim, but uh, yes. I know exactly what you're trying to say. Yeah, I don't know why I just totally uh, dropped the ball in that quote there, but the point remains the same. If you focus on building the player, the business will build itself. I truly believe that because I that, haven't that was it, ton, man. As, as much <laughs> a ton of marketing stuff, um, but getting results with players will build your business. Like the first month that I started my business, I had like five players. And through a certain, I ha- by the next month and a half, I was at like thirty-five or forty players. From all because you focus on building the player, not just, just building the business. Yeah, doing a good job building relationships with the kids, getting the players better, trying to do a good job, and parents or kids and parents are receptive to that. Okay, well, let's. Uh, any other really good pieces of advice from even Damon, uh, J Law, 
Ty Taylor from EGT, other trainers, name that trainer and name that piece of uh, advice or wisdom they gave you. Uh -huh. Could Jeez, be from the nice. podcast. I, I know you're a, a podcast listener. Sometimes I'm, I'm so bad when it comes to pulling quotes from people and I write stuff down, but like I said, Mike Shaughnessy was one of the big guys and Damon too. They're like, they're both like, you got to coach. Like I think coaching basketball is a really important thing for trainers to do. I think that it opens your horizons and it opens your mind to how people think and Again, you know, we, we have a certain way of viewing things in terms of the individual aspect, but under, but seeing it from that team side and what coaches actually want their players to be able to do is uh, is super important. So I think I think coaching is one of the biggest pieces of advice that you can give and study a lot of film. Um, I can't really think of, unfortunately, any uh, big pieces of advice off no. the top of my head. I, I know J Law. One of J Law's big things was like, don't undervalue yourself in terms of what you charge. Yeah. Like, if you're if you're good at what you do, act like a professional in charge. Like you're good at what you do. You know what I mean? Like, don't undervalue yourself because of, you know, like you'll make less than what you're worth. And if you're if you are that good, people will be willing to pay it. Man, I, Sam, I appreciate that. Uh, wrapping up here pretty soon. I, I know listen to the podcast and you're in the, uh, the basketball trainer mastermind group on Facebook. So I appreciate the engagement there and I appreciate the time on the, on the podcast. Is there anybody that you would like to shout out or any last words before we uh, wrap up? Uh, shout out to my guy, Damon for, uh, you know, he's been a huge influence for me when I first started in terms of the advice given and steps to help, set up in terms of like I when I first started I sent him out like a huge list of like 20 questions and he answered all of them and it was huge benefit in terms of me getting started uh so that was a he was a really big influence on me going forward uh so shout out to the group too I think there's a lot of good information for uh people to for especially for new trainers that can they can get from engaging in the group and reading a lot of the stuff that's been posted in the past Man, I appreciate that. And I definitely back up what you said about Damon. Uh, when I first met him, I met you through him, of course, but he, he's always been helpful and always been receptive too. Um, so I can't thank him enough for the knowledge he, he helped me out with. One of the real ones, I would say, in this entire space, the industry. Yeah, man. He's good people and he's great at what he does and the better person. And that's, that's, that can be hard to find. Facts. Speaking of finding something, where can we find you on social, Facebook, Instagram? Uh, so my Instagram is at Sam Franklin B ball and uh, on Twitter it's the same, just with one less L uh, ran out of, ran out of characters. So those are the uh, two main places you can find me. Got it. Sam, appreciate you, man. And uh, stay safe in this COVID-19 madness. Same to you, bro. Appreciate you having me on.